Good afternoon. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the school board meeting this Tuesday, April 16th, 20. Her mic's on. The mic is on. No, the green button's on. The green button's on. Let's, so it must, you have a second. <laughs> or more. Testing? No. We have a mic in. Check, check, check. Test, check. I don't hear Hello? I don't hear mine either. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the school board meeting this Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. Today, our student representative is Jalen. Benoni from Booker High School and will lead us in the pledge. The Booker High School JROTC cadets will present the colors. Please stand. Present arms, order arms, about face, forward march. So once again, our student representative today is Jalen Benoni from Booker High School. Uh, Jalen, it's nice for you to join us as our student representative, and we sure would like to hear some more about you. Thank you for having me. I'm a senior at Booker High School and one of our CFES Brilliant Student Pathways ambassadors, which simply just means I help people on campus, whether it be students signing up for scholarships or college, or whenever we have any donors or people of that nature come on campus, giving them a tour of our wonderful campus. I'm also the leader of our literacy club, which is simply just kids who gather and who love to write. I'm a three-time Theater Odyssey student playwright finalist, which simply just means I wrote a play, entered it into a contest, and was a finalist. Um, I am a 
University of North Florida commit. I'll be going in the summer. <laughs> where I'll be studying, well, my major will be interdisciplinary studies with a focus in film and screenwriting. Um, my main passion is really just connecting with people through my writing, touching people's hearts, and really just connecting with people through my work, whether it be my poetry, um, speaking, for example, I spoke at Embracing Our Differences fundraising luncheon uh, a couple months ago and getting ready to speak at Bell's Outlets. They just offered me a chance to speak there uh, in June and that's it. Absolutely wonderful. I understand you are also one of the leader tours for the vis opening of the Visual Performing Arts Program at Booker High School. And uh, on behalf of the board, I want to thank you for serving as our student representative. And we have a certificate that we'd like to present you with, as well as wish you the best of luck. Um, star Leadership Program. I'd like to welcome uh, Bailey Henson, Leadership Program Specialist for the Boys and Girls Club of Sarasota and DeSoto Counties and the star students in the audience today. Could you please stand so we can recognize you. STAR, which stands for Students Taking Active Roles, is a training program created to encourage youth to take active roles in their community. I would also like to invite the board members and superintendent to stay, to stay after the meeting for a question and answer session with the STAR students. Welcome. Glad you're with us this evening. And you can sit down. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Pleasure to have you here. Uh, today's special presentation highlighting Woodland Middle School, I would like to invite Mr. Mark Grossenbacher, principal of Woodland Middle, to please approach the podium to start the presentation. Mr. Grossenbacher. Well, good afternoon, and it is quite an honor um, to be here with so many wonderful people. Um, the board, also Superintendent Connor. I've been in Sarasota County Schools since 2001, and uh, to have the ability and the opportunity and the invitation to come here to spread the good news about the culture at Woodland Middle School, it really means a lot. So at Woodland Middle School, when you look at our collective commitments and who and what we're all about, we decided a couple years ago to come down to two distinct commitments. Number one, relationships have to be number one when everything that we discuss with our relationships with our students, with our staff, with our families, mm -hmm. so that our students not only show pride and believe in themselves in the school, but also they're ultimately then learning at high levels. And number two is the partnership with our community. You'll learn a little bit later that each of our clubs has a service component and that we feel it's very important that we have a collective responsibility not only to each other but to our families and to our community members and local businesses and with that in collaboration we can improve and really push not only our school but our students to thrive both academically and behaviorally to get them prepared for not only citizens at Woodland Middle School in Northport but citizens in life isn't that right yep. So moving forward, a very quick snapshot of, of who and what we, uh, what we are academically within the past few years. Um, very proud to say within the past few years, the past three years since James has been as a sixth grader, um, we've start to see this culture shift at work, meaning that we've gone from a school grade of 493 points, which is you know a moderate B, moving all the way up to a projected score of 535 this past year, which would put us at a very high B, if not approaching, you know, that level and we're already thinking some really good things aren't we James yeah. about where our students are going to score moving into uh, this spring's assessment so with that how do we create that culture 
And, and very, very soon, very early on, when I meet with the students in uh, our welcome back assemblies for the grade levels, and even when we meet with our wonderful staff at the beginning of the school year, we talk about number one, children must come first. Every decision we make, our students should be at the heart of that. Meaning that nothing more is, is more important than, as we said earlier, relationships that administrators, teachers, staff members have with their students and with their families. And with that, we'll see that number one variable when it does come, when you start to look at best practice and research, what is that number one variable on student achievement? It's that teacher to student relationship. And the foundation are the relationships and the culture of having the freedom to be able to communicate with each other in a safe way each and every day. When that happens, we start to see that relationship start. And we, and you know, we, and you may remember this too. Our staff, they are so good at this, of having those I believe in you messages when they're greeting students at the door. They're finding ways to connect that, hey, it might not be okay today, but guess what? We're going to learn from that and it's going to be okay tomorrow. So those I believe in you messages are incredibly important. And with that, it's our goal to improve. We may not be where we want to be, but we are going to get there and we're going to create short-term and long-term goals to make that happen academically and behaviorally, both through our, our you know, school and the classrooms, but also through our PBIS system and the way, again, we communicate and, and treat our students. So with my staff and teachers, we ask them to be purpose-driven, right? What is your purpose? For some, it was to be a coach, right, and to lead kids. Others, it might be the very best math teacher that they want to be. Others might be, I just want to be a positive role model. And each and every year, when we talk about our individualized professional development plan, we say, let's identify that purpose and let's then match it to your curriculum that you're teaching and let's see how we can meet those together and then refine and discuss those each and every year. So one year our purpose might be, I'm going to work on social skills within sixth grade. Next year, I'm going to take that into the relationships that we're going to have to improve in those scores. But finding that specific pur purpose, the number one is measurable but also attainable both in the way we treat and the way we achieve and perform. So when we start talking about being purpose-driven, the way I like to define this for my staff is, think back to your most memorable teacher. Who was that teacher, that coach, that staff member who had your back back in the day? What were their qualities? What did they say to you? How did they treat you? How did they welcome you when you arrived to school? And how did they say goodbye when it was time to leave? So, with that, we challenge our teachers, periods one through seven, to be your student's most memorable teacher. Realizing that, and we've heard this before, Dr. James Comer, no significant learning comes without that significant relationship. Building those relationships so then we're able to be that most memorable teacher. Because we also know what it's like to be the most memorable on the other way, right? Those, and we all have non-examples in our lives. So it's like be that positive example. So, you know, our, our students and our children period one through period seven, they're excited to go to their most memorable teacher. And that happens by greeting them at the door daily, communicating with them, supporting them on their test quizzes and projects, having those relationships with their parents, and finding a way to invest within your own school and home community. So with that, we challenge our students and our staff to dream big and set goals for yourself as teachers and staff members that then will transition to goals for our students. You know, finding those specific goals academically and behaviorally, where you want to see your students go as a teacher and a staff member and students, what do you want to do and to be able to achieve so that you're able then to meet in the middle and, and see those goals come to fruition. And then finally, be a difference maker. So when we challenge our staff members to set goals for students, let's be a difference maker. If we're going to be the most memorable teacher, let's do something memorable. Mm -hmm. Let's just not do the ordinary, let's do the extraordinary. And that comes with building those relationships and finding ways to make connections for not only our PLC, our coworkers, but for our students and the community. So one way within our culture that we found an easy win on making connections is to create opportunities for students to see teachers not only in staff members in the classroom or in the support role, but in the after school and before school support. And that would be starting, you know, to have clubs that then started as four or five, and then the four or five became six to 10 to where now we're over 30 clubs. 
I still remember, and you may remember him two years ago, Yamze Gonzalez. You know, he's no longer a student with us. He's been promoted and moved on. And Yamze came up to me and said, Mr. G, can we do a Mario Smash Brothers Club? And I said, oh, Yamze, we're not smashing anything right now. But I tell you what we can do. Tell me more about it, and let's see if we can make it happen. Find me a sponsor, and, and we will. And as you see, even in our list, Mario Smash Brothers today still meets on Mondays, met yesterday, and still continues to be that, that club or opportunity. As I said earlier, you know, and we hear this motto through our local rotaries and everything, service above self. When we talk to um, our club sponsors, we need to find ways to give back for the club to truly be meaningful. Not only are we going to have this activity or fun, but how can we give back to our school community, right? This year alone, our students, and James, you've been part of that, I think you're at over 50 yourself, have recorded and logged over 1,200 service hours, not just work on campus, but work at local humane societies, pet shelters, um, and so on. So wow. it's, been, it's been exciting. So when we add all those together, over 1,200, James. Yeah, that's a lot. So when you look, and we're not going to go through the list of programs, but what we do see are opportunities for students to be able to identify with an adult and have not only the conversations in the classroom that are very important, but the opportunity to, to identify with that adult on you know, similar and shared areas of interest. And when you put those together, students can't help to want to come to school, can't help to find ways to achieve and do their best to be successful not only for themselves, but for their school community and for each other. So we're really excited, aren't we, at Woodland Middle School that we've been able to you know, establish a culture like that. This year alone, and I'm, and I'm not bragging, just stating to where, we, where our students are at this point in time, um, we've had a lot of positivity start to snowball. You know, we've had, as you can see already, we've had our chorus um, receive straight superior ratings. And keep in mind, we have an acapella club as well. Our orchestra, fiddle club, our theater, our junior thespians, they've both gone and received excellence at MPA and state competitions. For the first time in school history, keep in mind we have the Thundercats, our drumline and school band. We have not only from beginning band, but advanced jazz receive, every single band received a superior, four superior ratings. Just recently at last week in solo ensemble that we hosted, we had over 25 superiors. Well, the middle school is able to brag that we have the only Barry Sachs player who wasn't playing in elementary school to be selected in the state of Florida um, as first chair for the All-State Band. We also had the student this past year, Harper Hambrick, and you know her from Principals Club, mm -hmm. the first middle school student for the Venice Art Festival to ever be selected as the overall winner in their contest, and to have a middle school student do that was phenomenal, yeah, actually, part of our art club. Yeah, I actually heard about that one over the radio. That was exciting, wasn't it? Yeah. It was really exciting. And recently, our TSA, a club we just uh, started a year and a half ago, went to states. Um, we had over 30 top 10 finishes, 10 state champions, second place overall in the state of Florida, and then uh, was recognized, of course, at STC recently as the top CTE middle school at a district competition. Even in athletics, you know, my background, James, you know, we're starting to see a lot of championships coming through. Just recently, the boys won the district county championship for the second year in a row. And we already mentioned the community service hours. And then, uh, you know, Ms. Sabo and I, we had the honor earlier today to celebrate with 19 students who received full tuition scholarships. We got word yesterday, and we celebrated with them before we came here. Full tuition scholarships for Take Stock and Children. And that is phenomenal, and we're very proud of those accomplishments. So let's not hear from Mr. G anymore. We want to hear from our customers, right? That's why we're all here. So this is James Flum, eighth grade student. Um, James and I met first in Principals Club, correct? Yep. And James, why don't you tell them about yourself and what Woodland means to you and maybe some of the clubs that you've been a part of. Um, uh, when I was for, when I first um, found out I was going to Woodland, thanks to my mom, I was nervous. Like I was to the point where I was sick that night before school. But I got to school the next morning. I got started my first period class. Loved it. And over the three years, I think I've been in like what six, seven clubs yeah, at least. Ba I had a band and news crew in um, in six, news crew in seventh, and then along with choir. Then this year, I'm also in choir again, and I was in news crew there for a little bit. And um, in, in terms of the, um, uh, uh, what did they call it again? Um, well, you were in TCG Pokemon. Yeah, um, the, 
Um, but yeah, for clubs, I was in the TCG Arcade Club that we started last year for a little bit. I've been in Principal's Club since basically the beginning. It was the first club I ever signed up for. I've been in our FCA Club, which, which stands for Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Basically, Bible study that goes from 8:30 to 9:15. I attend that basically every yeah. Thursday. I think you come for the donuts. <laughs> that too. <laughs> okay, that too. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I just love helping out around the school. And that picture there on the slide, um, we were we have our um, our school's logo in our courtyard in front of the office. I actually laid down one of those bricks there. At first, I thought I would not be able to do that because I thought they were going to be heavy. Mr. G actually helped me out with that. Yeah. We, we made sure we have it. First, James was like, I don't think so. And I said, nope, buddy. It's all you. <laughs> yeah. And we got it done, didn't we? Yep. That's right. Yep. So uh, it's been really exciting, hasn't it? Yeah. So we want to thank each and every one of you for allowing us to be able to showcase the culture at Woodland Middle School. I can't say enough about the staff that we have at Woodland Middle School, our wonderful teachers and support staff, because they are the ones, as you've seen, that make this happen. And it has been just a, a wonderful place to live and learn, hasn't it? Yes, it has. All right. Well, you have a, we have a gift for our board members, is that correct? Yep. All right. So we do have uh, yearbooks from our yearbook club. Um, our, uh, this year's yearbooks are not in quite yet, so we have last year's yearbooks, and we wanted to make sure, um, Superintendent Connor and our board, that you guys each had a copy of our yearbook. All right, can we, uh, can we come up? Thank you. Uh, thank you to James, and uh, I'd like to recognize you, James, for doing such a phenomenal job representing uh, Woodland Middle School. And uh, Mr. Grossenbacher, I'm going to embarrass you because I had the privilege of working with you several years ago, and you you did then, and you continue to focus in on relationships and uh, building up your community. Uh, James, the Wildcats in Northport are in phenomenal hands. Good job. Good job. Mr. Super Rosenbacher, I want to thank you. I know it's uh, it's challenging sometimes to get up from down from Northport to get all the way up here by three o'clock. But uh, to share your story, I've been on your campus uh, several times this year. I have met James, and actually, when you put me on the news uh, in the morning when I came up there, James was doing a fabulous job of directing me what to do and what to say when I got on the news crew that morning. So great job! Th I'm glad you could be here. Thank you for what you do. You can see what culture means in a school. And when you have a leader like yourself who focuses on students and staff and making sure that there's that holistic experience, the sky's the limit. So congratulations for all you do. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent Connor, uh, your report, please. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Jaylen, I just want to say thank you for being our representative today. As a former graduate of the University of North Florida, I am excited to hear that you have committed to be an Osprey. <laughs> All right, for our superintendent's report, um, we're going to have a couple of highlights here, consent highlights. Before we get there, there is a great picture of here where we just recently got to dedicate and do a ribbon cutting of our new VPA, uh, Visual Performing Arts Auditorium at Booker High School. What a fabulous uh, experience and facility that is. And thank you, Dr. Shelley, for hosting such a great job, a uh, great ribbon cutting ceremony. So congratulations on that. Okay, for our consent item, uh, a couple of items I want to highlight. Number nine is the approval of the agreement between PACBAC and uh, PACBAC, not BACPAC, uh, in Sarasota County. Uh, it is, um, you know, we have to embrace technology. And artificial intelligence is alive and well, and it is coming fast and furious. We can sit there and try to hold it off, but it's going to essentially be an essential part of our lives. Um, and so this agreement is going to partner with our high schools, specifically in our ninth and 10th grade ELA classes, uh, to help students improve their writing and critical thinking skills. And it will help aid instructor, uh, our instructors with grading and monitoring because writing can be very time consuming and time intensive when it comes to grading papers, right? And so this program is going to provide real time feedback to students instantaneously and using that artificial intelligence to really help them improve their writing skills and to help lessen the load of teachers when they have to grade all of those writing assignments. So we're, we're uh, excited to 
somewhat pilot that this year to see how it goes. Uh, and we are going to jump on the AI bandwagon where we, where we do see where it can fit and uh, help us in situations. So looking forward to that. And I'll report back how that's going as, uh, as the year progresses next year. Um, we did approve our architect for the Venice High School Stadium Enhancement Project. We're going to be revamping uh, some of the restrooms, doing some security enhancements. We did a lot in terms of the infrastructure around the fields, but there are extraneous things outside of the field clubs and all that need to be um, enhanced. And so we uh, were able to select our architect, which I don't see it on here, but I think it was, who was that? It wasn't, it's not on the slide. Who was our highest ranked firm? <laughs> I think it was, uh, we'll get that information. They left that off the slide there. As well as the construction manager, which I'll come back to that and share that in just a moment. Want to announce that uh, Pine Views Jungle, Team Jungle 3627 received the Engineering Inspiration Award at the South Florida Regional First Robotics Competition. And their mentor, Andrew Worthington, also received the Woody Flowers Finalist Award. So congratulations to them. And Pine View also qualified this, this uh, engineering club will be in the first Robotics World Championship competition. So congratulations. So in e we do have a couple of events this month in terms of our ESC engagement. On April 17th, our ESC department will be hosting a um, session, a Zoom webinar on implementing in-home behavioral strategies. On the 23rd, they will be hosting the Making Reading Instruction Explicit webinar. So if you are interested in participating in that, please go to our website and join and register. All trainings will be offered at both 10 a.m. and at 5.30 p.m. STC will be having an open house on April 18th, 2024. Don't miss the boat. Cast for your career. That is our theme. At our Northport branch, we'll be doing campus tours, talking about financial aid assistance, doing raffles. Come out to learn as much as you can about what STC has to offer. I think you'll be very surprised. We also are hosting job fairs on April 23rd from 10 to 1 p.m. at the Carlisle Inn on Conference Center. So we're hiring for instructional and non-instructional positions for the next school year. So if you're interested, please come out. And our kickoff to kindergarten party is April 23rd and 25th. We'll be hosting one at STC North down in Northport. And we will be holding one on our STC Beneva Road campus on the 25th from 5.30 to 7.30 both nights, open exclusively to incoming public and charter kindergartners and their families. Also, we'll be hosting a baby shower event on the 27th of this month from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the Robert Taylor Community Complex, free for expecting parents and families with children up to age three. Come out to learn more about what we'll have to offer and how we can support you. There'll be raffles and great prizes. And I'm very, very excited about the launch of our new website. Friday at about 1 o'clock, we are able live to t uh, launch our website. It is refreshed, revamped, and again, we talk about artificial intelligence. It is there to assist our public in interacting with our website. You will see a feature on there in the bottom corner. It's called Chat with Sarah, as in Sarah Soda, and it is uh, powered by artificial intelligence, and it is very robust searching capabilities, and will be able to help you uh, pretty much answer any question, hopefully, uh, that it's at least contained within that site. Uh, it comes in 130 languages, so there is site translation that will translate the entire page, the entire website. All of our school, individual school websites have been refreshed and uh, are on this new platform, and we're very excited. And there's an app that goes on, and so if you uh, are an active parent, you definitely want to ensure that you have the app because you'll be able to get the calendars and school lunch menus and all of the great things. And eventually, coming in July, we will be launching Rooms, which will be an all-encompassed communication tool between parents, students, and staff that stays and lives within that particular uh, platform. So we're excited about what is launched and what is to come. And congratulations to our communications team. They got that done in less than three, in about three months. A tremendous, tremendous feat.
And this coming week on April 23rd is Bus Driver Appreciation Day. So let's, uh, let's congratulate and thank all of our bus drivers for what they do. It's a tough job. And April is National Volunteer Month. I want to thank all of our volunteers. We're actually going to have our reception uh, next week uh, at the Aura, I believe, the new Aura, uh, which is a beautiful facility, and congratulate and thank them for all of their outstanding uh, work in our school district. But um, if you want to learn more about volunteering for our school district, it is on our website at the top, very visible. So click there to learn more. And we look forward to engaging with you. And that is all, Madam Chair. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Superintendent, it was Gilbane, Harvard Jolly, and Gilbane. Oh, yeah, Harvard Jolly is the architect, and Gilbane is our construction for the new Venice project. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Connor. Um, we're going to uh, welcome everyone to the Hearing of Citizens segment of our meeting. Uh, we have uh, 25 uh, public comment cards uh, filled out. This form allows the community to engage with the school board on matters concerning our education system. All speakers should have submitted a completed comment card before this segment. Speakers will be called in the order received. Each speaker will state their full name and shall confine their remarks to the business of the school board. Each speaker will have up to three minutes. A timer will signal when one minute remains. Please conclude promptly when the timer ends. Please address your comments to the board, not to the audience. We expect all remarks to be delivered in a manner consistent with school board policy. Abusive language, personal attacks, or disruptive behavior will not be tolerated. Please direct any personal grievances or personal issues in writing to the school board office. Audience members are requested to listen quietly and respectfully. Outbursts, applause, or other interruptions that disrupt the meeting are not acceptable. Any person that interferes with the expeditious or orderly process of this meeting after first being warned that such continued interference will result in removal will be removed. There are speakers, system, uh, there is a system set up in the room behind me that allow board members to hear public comment when, a, when stepping away from the dais. When your name is called, please approach the podium. If you choose to pass, you will forfeit your time to address the board. We appreciate your cooperation. Let's begin with our first speaker. Uh, first up is Barbara Vaughn, followed by Lieutenant Colonel Duff Smiley, USA, USAF retired. Can't hear you, I'm sorry. Um, maybe if you put the mic down. No, I don't think I think the mic's on. We it's it's a day for mic issues. <laughs> We'll start your uh, time over, Mrs. Vaughn. Now it's on. It wasn't on before. <laughs> okay, once again, my name is Barbara Vaughn. You know me well. I'm a resident of Sarasota County. I'm so happy today to see Mrs. Ziegler still in her chair on the board. I've talked to you before about the tattoo on my arm, Second Chronicles. 714. But I thought today I'd tell you where that came from and why. God was warning his people when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people. And then he tells them how to avoid all that. He says, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Now most of us do pray. Humbling ourselves is a different issue. That's a little harder for most of us. But he says, if they pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That's a big promise. 
but it's a lot he's asked of us. It's actually pretty simple. Acknowledge him as the way maker, as the promise keeper, as the miracle worker. He is our light at the end of the tunnel. If we will keep our eyes on him, keep our minds on him, and not be diverted by evil. There's so many times in this chamber that the air has been filled with vitriol. It's rather disgusting sometimes. We need to turn back to God, not just in this chamber, but we can't control much of what goes on nationwide. This is where we have control. The board of our Sarasota County Schools, our local elected officials, this is where we need to take leadership and believing religious leadership. Your faith should form your values and your values should inform your vote. Amen. Amen. Next is Lieutenant Colonel Duff Smiley, United States Air Force, retired, and then Layla Newcomb. Welcome. Uh, my wife wanted me to let everybody know that uh, today, April 16th is a momentous day. It is the 20th anniversary of my 40th birthday. <laughs> My friend Sean calls me Duffy for democracy. Today I am here as Duffy for decency to discuss civility and respect at board meetings. At this time, our public comments section of the board does nothing to forward the education of our children. It is an example of how not to communicate, how not to respect each other, and how to destroy any possibility of compromising or understanding. And I find it's ironic that the side that talks about hate speech is conducting the most hateful and vitriolic hate campaign I have ever witnessed, and I've been in war zones. The LBGTQICRTDEI Mafia is building a pillory in their witch hunt for Bridget Ziegler. The Mafia knows that Bridget will not resign, the purpose for their efforts is to gain political advantage in upcoming elections. This from the side that decries politics and education. This from the side that thinks anybody who opposes their ideology should be humiliated and silenced. Initially, I favored Bridget's resignation, but after her watch her endure the unendurable, I admire her bravery, and I'm a military guy, I know that kind of stuff, in the face of unimaginable hate for her and her family. Under immense pressure, she continues to do what 58% of the voters elected her to do. She believes that people should be treated equally and provided with the same educational opportunities regardless of race, religion, or sexual identity. She supports parents as advocates for her children. In my religion, we believe in forgiveness. What a concept. We believe that you're not judged by the single worst mistake of your life. So stop Bridges' persecution now and let the board do its job. It's time to unify our community around the education of our children. And in closing, I'd like to talk about disrespect of the four uh, I don't know if they're graduates of this uh, system or not, but the four young adults who were seated during the presentation of the flag. Unacceptable. And we ought, I'm sorry, we ought to be embarrassed for not calling that out. It used to be you couldn't get away with that. Okay? People were proud of their country. People stood up when, when the flag went by. And they should do that still today. Thank you. Thank you. Layla Newcomb and Wendy Rosen. Welcome, Mrs. Newcomb. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, sorry, guys. Uh. Oh, brother, thank you for not turning the light on yet. <laughs> 
I'm Leela Newcomb, grandmother of three in Sarasota Public Schools, and I'm happy to see that the subject of pre-K has been addressed, is being addressed. In all the discussion about pre-K, I've not yet seen exactly what is to be taught to that age of children. Um, and I know for a fact that pre-K is a great, great thing, but I do think we need to be careful about what we're expecting of children from this a of this age and that we're not trying to shove things down their throats that could actually end up affecting their development. While there are always exceptions, forcing academic learning too early can stunt the imagination and creativity of minds of that age. When I took a course in uh, in midlife in child psychology, which I did, my teacher repeated this mantra over and over. Play is the work of the very young. Firstly, it's a fact that it normally takes between 400 to 500 repetitions to develop new synapses in the brain, but if learned through play, it takes only 20 to 30 repetitions. What a difference uh, creative play designed to teach. In addition, we cannot necessarily expect young children to sit in circle time and be still a lot when they may need to be moving around. Kids, especially boys, with some exceptions on both sides, get pigeonholed into labels like ADHD absolutely wrongly and with dire consequences down the road. It's important that nobody's turned off about school before it even begins for them. My grandchildren were lucky enough to go to a pre-K, which sadly went under during COVID, but it was so well done that everyone learned their letters and numbers, some history, among other things, uh, cleverly through various projects, including art, drama, and dance. Even more importantly, they learned thinking skills. A couple of them could read, but mostly they were all just well prepared for what was ahead of them. And I remember my oldest one when she went to regular kindergarten, uh, not liking it a whole lot at first, and I asked her what the difference was. She said that pre-K was play, play, play. That was how she saw it. Uh, not free for all play, but expertly directed. And I hope that we'll let those with proper training and understanding of early childhood education do their job and not try and force what their brains are not ready for. And for your information, they've all thrived. One of them's graduating this year, thank you, Dr. Shelley, with an ACE diploma, among many other things. And uh, they were enhanced by that experience. Thank, thank you. you. Wendy Rosen, and then Christy Carwatt. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to know when this board is going to learn that Tallahassee is not like Sarasota and they shouldn't be trying to force us to do things on our board that we're not prepared to do. We're no different than if, it, imagine if Palm Beach was trying to tell Key West what to do. That wouldn't go so well. Well, this isn't going very well either. Karen, the solution is really very simple. It's not on the left and it's not on the right. It's right in the middle. And many of us who attend these meetings are right there in the middle. And believe it or not, those of us who come here, we really do care. Most of us are responsible people. We're parents, we're grandparents, some are retired teachers. And every week we gather together before these meetings to come up with solutions for you and to build a consensus among ourselves about what we're, how we're going to approach solutions. All we want to do is to close just enough of the gap to create a better working and learning environment for teachers, administrators, and especially students. If you want to, Karen, you can build a bridge with moderates. You can create a really great community advisory committee and that would be a good start. Create a sounding board of people who are problem solvers with locals that really care. Some of us in this that speak out every, every week. 
openly collaborate and find workable solutions. You can build trust, you can build relationships, and you can create a safe place for people to listen and to speak and to create consensus that benefits our schools, not Tallahassee. Believe me, I know what it's like to deal with a large, angry mob. I know what it feels like to be cornered. And you'll keep feeling that way until you become a consensual leader. Do you know that what those of us in the middle are really worried about? We're worried about each of the fringes. We feel that our schools and hospitals have been hijacked by, not by conservatives, but instead by vulture capital investors and tinfoil hat science deniers. One group is, a power, is power hungry for profits and the other is paving their way to path to heaven, and some think they're doing both at the same time. Most politicians in this state believe that any headline is a good headline if it gets TV coverage. Do you really like being their sacrificial lamb? Because that's what you are. Karen, you can earn the, our support and build respect if you would just get out of the business of politics and get back into the business of education. If you don't, you'll surely get Bill burned in a bigger scandal. Thank, Thank you. you. Christy Carwatt and then Richard Canarelli. Good afternoon. I'm Christy Carwatt, a former parent a proud retired teacher again. Once again, I have one of my former students being honored here today. As I said, we're producing not only hardworking, intelligent students, we're producing wonderful young women, just like Crystal over here. And I'm a Sarasota taxpayer for over 40 years. I'm here to support the passage of Mr. Edwards' resolution. I watched the workshop today, so I know how each board member feels about this resolution. Yet, many in the community need to be reassured that each member of this board truly believes in the motto, every student, every day. Mrs. Marinelli, with all due respect, if you were concerned about political theater, why haven't you addressed it before? Almost every move that Mrs. Ziegler makes is political theater. Her transphobic t-shirt is just one example. Do you really think that trans students in Sarasota schools believe she supports the motto, every student, every day? How about her comment at the March 19th workshop? You know, the one in which she said that students who do not speak English are, and I quote her, more of a burden than usual. Why did she even need to address the topic in public anyway? Why didn't she just email the appropriate department head for her answers? I think the timing of bringing up immigrants couldn't have been more politically timed with all the clamoring about immigration on Fox News. No wonder many in the community question her commitment to all students in this district. How about her past involvement in the Leadership Institute, which teaches people how to be politically conservative board members, and her involvement in the hate group Moms for Liberty? Speaking about political theater, we have the queen on the board. Mrs. Ziegler has made it quite clear how she feels about certain students and their families. So if the rest of you on the board want to demonstrate that unlike Mrs. Ziegler, you truly are committed to every student every day, and that you intend to fulfill your obligation to educate all students of school age without regard to immigration status, national origin, race, color, religion, or sex, you will vote to approve the resolution. A yes vote signals that you do believe in every student every day. A no vote signals that you do not really believe in every student every day. How are you going to vote? Richard Canarelli and then Sebastian Martinez. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Canarelli and thank you for this opportunity uh, to share my ideas. I've attended several of these board meetings in the past and I've spoken at a few of them regarding issues that I am concerned about. Uh, not the least of which is the attempt to slowly Christianize uh, the Florida educational system. The meetings I have attended appear to be in three parts. The first is largely ceremonial, which involves a, a flag ceremony, student awards, and glowing reports by the superintendent. 
This is followed by a lengthy period of constituent concerns like mine. And the third is the business section where formal votes are taken on issues that have been discussed and agreed upon beforehand. What strikes me is that there almost never a response to the issues raised by, raised by the public. Instead, the board politely and stoically listens to everyone until the speakers are exhausted. There's never a dialogue or a superintendent presentation about sensitive issues such as dropout rates, school lunches, incidents of bullying, teacher shortages. So I'm therefore going to ask a series of questions and I'm purposely not going to use all of my time. Uh, when I am finished, I will remain silent to give the board an opportunity to respond. And one final note, I am considering not voting in favor of the ad valorem school tax when it comes up until I get some answers to the questions. Here are the questions. What is the fiscal impact of giving vouchers to private and religious schools? Specifically, what is the total cost to the Sarasota School District? How is this uh, impacting hiring teachers? Are there going to be any cutbacks? Our taxpayer dollars are going to religious schools and parents who homeschool. Is there any oversight over what's being taught? The Florida Constitution has a no aid clause which specifically prohibits public funds going to religious institutions and religious schools. Why isn't this law being observed? The Florida legislature just passed a law requiring that a course on communism be developed by 2026. Does this board believe that a course on fascism needs to be taught? <laughs> Tens of thousands of Americans died during World War II fighting fascists, and fascism is still alive today. I will wait. I will not say anything else. I will stand here quietly and give somebody an opportunity to re respond to my questions. I'm overwhelmed. I'm still waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Sebastian Martinez, then Michael Weddle. Ooh. All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, my name is Sebastian Martinez, um, and I wasn't planning on coming today. Um, I have a really weird outfit put on that I picked out. <laughs> I was at work, um, and I was listening to the workshop earlier, and I was painting a house in Siesta, and I had blue painter's tape on my shoulder with my phone there so I could listen to the workshop. And I heard Robin talk about political theater, and seconds later, I heard a paper rip. And for a second, I thought I was listening to the State of the Union from a few years back. <laughs> you also said that you don't usually get upset, but you're probably the only board member who starts breakdancing and clutching your pearls if a fly buzzes at you wrong. It's unserious. My point is, and I'm going to lean into it, is you can't talk about political theater with a straight face. You talk about a front when that's probably the only attribute you hold and skill you contribute to this board. Right now, you act clueless. Don't watch. Um, excuse me, we're not going to personally attack board okay. members. Um, decorum, please. Yes, ma'am. This is not a bully puppet. OK. Right now, a board member lacks the attention skills that would be expected of a student in a classroom to a teacher. And as an elected official, I'd expect that you would listen to me while I speak. Anyways, you act clueless, but you follow almost verbatim political campaign tactics that were talked about at political trainings you and Mrs. Rose attended. What you tried doing earlier was put up a front, act clueless, try to campaign for Tom's opponent, and then tear a piece of paper. But again, you're not on the board actively trying to listen to students, take input, and facilitate change. 
You're only there. I won't continue. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Michael Weddle and then August Ray. Rachel, did I say something? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, hi, I'm uh, Mike Weddle, a Sarasota County resident and school volunteer. Uh, you know, when my boys were uh, school age, when they were in school, there was a show on TV, it was called the Mythbusters, and, and they loved it. And the idea was that they would bust myths, like they literally installed sprinklers in the roof of a warehouse to show that you wouldn't be drier if you ran through the rain. Um, in the spirit of Mythbusters, I want to talk about a myth that, that we have here, in my opinion, and that myth is there are no banned books in Sarasota County. I'll quote an article from the Herald Tribune eight months ago, and this is quoting, I work in a Sarasota County thrift store. This summer the store received thousands of books from schools and classroom libraries, and they were marked with the names of schools and teachers. Indeed, we have heard from this podium how students had to help teachers box up school libraries when those books were eliminated. When Ron DeSantis moved back to Florida after the Iowa caucuses, he was kind of lashing out, and I understand it was a very embarrassing time for him, but one of the things that he said was, if teachers removed books from classrooms in Florida, it was because they were under the influence of bad actors in the school administration. That was his term, bad actors. Do we have bad actors? I don't know. You guys would know better than I. What I do know is that now that there's a settlement allowing students and teachers to discuss some real life issues like gender identity, teachers who emptied their classroom bookshelves because of vague statutes and the worry of being targeted are not going to rush back to reestablish those libraries. My belief is that the school board should be vocal in encouraging them to do just that, to rebuild the libraries. And since this happened on your watch, you should provide a budget for them to do so. Students need books, and I do hope the governor was wrong when he said that we have bad actors in the school district. Thank you. August Ray, and then John Wilson. Hello. Sorry. Hello, my name is August Ray, and I'm a senior at Sarasota High School. If someone told me six months ago that I would be spending my senior skip day attending a school board meeting, I would have called them crazy. But I find it hard to enjoy myself and celebrate my senior year when I know that I'm leaving behind a broken school board. And so I'm here. And I'd like to be very clear when I say I'm not here because it is fun. It's not. And I'm not here because I enjoy doing this. I really don't. And I'm not here for attention because you guys don't pay me any. No, I'm here because things need to change. I need my underclassmen friends to be able to go to school and be themselves in a way that I couldn't. I need my teachers to be able to inspire their students to read in a way that speaks to each student individually. I need our schools to prepare our students for real life and teach them inclusive and comprehensive sex ed. Because quite frankly, having one day in eighth grade to talk about puberty is not enough sex ed for anyone. I need the incoming freshmen of every high school in this county to be given more opportunities than I was and to be given far more support than I was. So many things need to change with this county, but in order for there to be any change, I need this board to listen to me and every other student who's here, who's here every week pleading for you to help us. Because your silence, it speaks volumes. Thank you. John Wilson and Anya Dennison. Welcome, Mr. Wilson. It's been a minute. You know, I, like I have a speech um, all written out, <clears throat> but I was just sitting here and I'm hearing like, hey, we want an olive branch to, you know, maybe we can come together, some different groups. But in the same breath, hey, you want one of these stop the circus signs? So, I, you know, I guess no one wants to come together. But I've never seen so many clowns not want a circus in my life because I've been watching this for months and it's disgusting. Every school board meeting is a, is a political circus. And the people who have claimed, to, claimed conservatives were bringing politics to school board are proving they have no interest in the school students as a whole. They set up their political propaganda right outside these doors and then stand there and talk politics and push ideas that permanently harm kids. 
I've been watching the school board meetings for months, and most of the people speaking don't even have kids in the district, and many aren't even from Sarasota. They have no intention of setting up success for my kids. The goal is to make more kids more confused and make them not trust their own parents, because I hear that a lot. Someone stood here and said the words, said that the words on the back of my shirt were going to cause people to die. Of all the scandals in the district has been through, my shirt is what outrages these people. They sure were an outrage when the current principal of Riverview basically destroyed a child's education. Yeah, I'm still talking about the DJ case because it shocks me that no one still has been held accountable. And even the court decided that the district failed him. I've had the kids in this school district for 30 years. The previous school board left decades of children who never learned to read at grade level. And what's funny is that for all these years, the left enjoyed our kids and had nothing but praise for the school, former school board. They were okay with our kids falling behind as long as they were giving access to them without parents knowing. Now that we have parental rights in education, the left is outraged because you know the one that don't say gay bill, but, it, but that's all they care about. They're not outraged that the kids are, are so behind academically. They're outraged that they can't talk about sex to my kids without my knowledge. I know a lot of employees in the district and I know for a fact that trans kids aren't getting bullied. Believe me, when I, believe me I, you, I would hear about it because if you have your stuff on the pulse, then you know what's going on. But my kids were targeted by this district by a school board member who had no problem forcing masks on their face. He doesn't care about my kids. And, or he would have listened to the 90% of the people that showed up that said they didn't want masks. Thank you. Anya Dennison, then Deb Hayes. Welcome, Ms. Dennison. Hi, I'm Anya, a graduate of Sarasota Schools. Last month, I asked you all to do a better job of representing this district's students, teachers, and parents. Here's what I said because the circumstances haven't changed. Sarasota students deserve your attention. They deserve to be listened to, and they deserve to have their feedback incorporated into your decision making. For months now, you've had so many students stand up here and tell you that they're hurting, that going to school in this district is painful. They're only here because they want to make their daily experiences in school better, or at least no longer harmful. Can you meet them where they're at? Can you partner with students like you say you do with parents? Leadership is listening to and working alongside the people you represent to build a better school district where its students and staff feel comfortable being themselves. I also talked about how if you read the Don't Say Gay settlement, you'll see that every single thing that the Don't Say Gay law changed in our public schools over the last two years has been reverted back. This means that so many things, so many of the reasons that school environments have been harming your students have been legally reversed. But because we haven't seen any communication about this or any implementation in schools, those things haven't changed. Parents and students don't know about this change. Schools still aren't safe, but they can be. The majority of your constituents don't know that their educational experiences now, as of this settlement, have the ability to be drastically improved and healed. They deserve a board that they can count on to relay this information to them. You can be that board. You can discuss this important settlement and information gap in a workshop. You should listen to the feedback you receive and talk about how you can better inform the district's constituents because this decision deeply affects students, parents, and teachers' day-to-day -day experiences in the schools you oversee. Thank you. Thank you. Deb Hayes and then Paulina Testerman. Good afternoon, school board members, Mr. Connor, Mr. Duggan. My name is Deb Hayes. I'm a retired long-term administrator from this district. I'm here not representing sides. I'm not representing conservative, liberal, anything. Um, as someone who had to build consensus a great deal through my career, 
I'm, I'm struck by some things. And as you know, I attend a lot of the board workshops and meetings. And I've been struck by the consistent comments from the public that the board doesn't hear them. I've been frustrated that the board has not taken the opportunity to publicly address some of the concerns. So the lack of an affirmative, assertive response has left many in the public to return the next meeting, and the next meeting, and the next meeting, trying to make a point and trying to be heard. I guess for that reason, I was astounded that you as a board did not give the resolution proposed by Mr. Edwards in today's workshop even a cursory consideration. Your comments that you are constitutional officers and as such must follow the law doesn't play well in the public. You have seen that. I don't know what motivated Mr. Edwards to come forward with that resolution and frankly, I don't care. What I do care about is that a simple act of the entire board, regardless of political affiliation, signing on to a resolution that affirms the laws that govern equal educational treatment and value of all students would have gone a long way in helping set a tone of unity in the board and given the public a teeny bit of optimism that their concerns were being heard. What would have hurt? I really felt sad. I think it was a very sad missed opportunity. Thank you. Paulina Testerman and then Shannon Clement. I'm going to give the same speech, just not as nicely. I listen to today's school board workshop, and Tuesdays are my laundry day, so it's always playing in the background, and I was really excited. Like, you guys were talking about VPK and really important topics, and I thought, great, I don't have to go today. I was like, I get to stay home, I put pot roast on, I'm ready to have dinner with my kids, but, you know, you guys don't. Don't let us down. Toward the end of the meeting, Mr. Edwards introduced a resolution. He simply was asking the board to reconfirm their commitment to support every student every day. He was asking the board to formally announce that they are pledging their support for all students, regardless of sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, part-time, full-time status, disability, race, or national origin. He wasn't asking the board to donate a kidney. He was asking you to show this public, prove to the public that this board actually cared about every student every day, not just the motto, not just the sales pitch. What a profoundly generous gesture Mr. Edwards made to help sow some trust between the community and the board. But no sooner did Mr. Edwards suggest it than the trifecta of intolerance started up, Mrs. Ziegler, Mrs. Rose, and Mrs. Marinelli. Boy, Mrs. Marinelli, you get an Oscar for today's performance. You tore up the resolution like a child, like a child throwing a temper tantrum. Who does that? What kind of example is that for our students? You want us to be respectful in these chambers? You can't be respectful to your own board members? I appreciate Mr. Enos's comment about why he felt this resolution wasn't necessary. Mr. Enos, I really do. I really felt like like your response was a like had integrity but I need to remind you, Mr. Enos, why it was necessary. Because I don't think you know the history of who you sit next to. Because Mrs. Marinelli, during her campaigning, stated, I became a school counselor in Southside Elementary for 20 years, and not none of this stuff, transgender, none of this stuff ever came up in my 40 years. Never did a kid come and talk to me about it. Can you understand, Mr. Enos, why Mr. Edwards may feel that Mrs. Marinelli should formally support the resolution as a way to prove her support for all students, even transgender students? And Mr. Enos, don't forget Mrs. Mar Mrs. Ziegler, the queen of homophobia and transphobia. Maybe she needs to sign the resolution to remind our community that in spite of her obvious attacks on the LGBT community, she will still not discriminate. I, I am not going to I'm not allow, personally attacking. I am not I going am to, repeating. I, I am going to tell you. I am not going to allow personal attacks. We are this not going not to bully. We are not Difference. going to bully. I am not using anything other than the facts before me, Mrs. Rose. I'm going to stop you when you're bullying a board member. We don't allow it in schools. Please be a role model for our students. Mrs. Rose. Mrs. Rose, during her own town hall, was asked about illegal students in our district, and she replied, quote, if you listen to our government, governor, if we have illegal students coming in, he's not letting them stay here. As far as I'm concerned, we could delete the Federal Department of Education. It's against the Constitution. Mr. Enos, can you see why Mr. Edwards introduced a resolution to ensure the community knows that this board knows the laws that it's supposed to be following? Because the trifecta of intolerance says one thing on the da dais and something else in private. 
You're not included on that list, Mr. Enos, because you are leading with integrity. I don't always agree with you, but I respect the fact that you come here and you explain where you're standing and where you're coming from. Thank you. Personally, Thank I'm convinced you. that if Mr. Uh, Edwards you can turn came out. Off the mic. Uh, your time is up, Mrs. Testerman. Shannon Clement and then Jessica Thomason. Good afternoon all, Shannon Clement, I'm the parent of a child currently enrolled in our school system and I'm also a citizen or a resident of Sarasota County, so based on today's workshop, what I say should hold more weight than pretty much anyone else that comes up here that doesn't have a kid in the district or that doesn't live here from whatever what you all are saying. I don't have notes today and I don't have notes today because of the fact that there was so much going on I just couldn't wrap my head around everything. You all just can't seem to get out of your own way, can you? There was a lot of stuff brought up today and what I found interesting and funny is that the one thing that was brought up was political theater, yet I didn't hear very much in regards to um, member comments about actual student achievement. Everything that was discussed had nothing to do with direct student achievement. You all want to tell us that we need to focus on that, yet you all cannot do the same. I said something in the previous meeting about the fish rots from the head down. The question was raised in today's workshop as to why this doesn't happen at other school boards. The reason why is because this school board, and I'll admit it, the last school board doesn't have a freaking backbone. And I'm going to leave you with that. The reason why all this happens is because you have parents, like myself, regardless of what size of, side of the aisle we come from, that are upset and that are coming to you with our concerns. We want to focus on student achievement. We want to focus on ensuring that all of our teachers have the supplies that they need and the resources to be able to provide that quality content to our students. Yet every single board meeting and every single workshop, political theater is brought up by this board that we are replying to. I had comments written up about self-reflection that I was going to present tonight and it couldn't be more appropriate than now, but it was a bit too long and I felt this was more important to say. If this makes me an activist, so be it. But if we're going to take on activism at this podium, we also need to take up proselytizing. Both are protected under the First Amendment. If I am allowed to listen to someone come up here and pray, they get to listen to me advocate for my kid. They're going to listen to me advocate for every single one of my, one of my kid's friends. And it's going to happen time and time again until this board grows a backbone. Thank you. Jessica Thomason and then Jim Kohler. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, board. Um, my comments are mainly directed to Tim Enos because other than Tom, you are the last person up there that I trust at all. I don't even know where to begin. I sat in the audience. I'm looking at Bridget. I mean, it's unbelievable. You love the attention. We all know it. You say these things in the last 10 minutes of public comment so, so that you can bring out the crowds and then claim that we're all activists. I'm a parent. I have two children. I'm here to represent people who cannot be here at 3 o'clock. I have lost all respect for the rest of this board other than Tim and Tom. That's it. I need you, the way that you tell us to be respectful, Ms. Rose, and to not be a bully, forget the resolution, okay? Forget about paying an attorney and forget about a letter to the governor. I don't even need that from you. I need you to look at your colleague and say, stop acting like a spoiled child. Stop it. You can do that for free. Please, I am begging you, and Tim Enos, please, I respect you. I don't agree with everything that you do, but you have integrity, just like Paulina said. The reasons you gave made sense, and I would like it to go on record that every single person on this board today said that they would follow the law except for Bridget Ziegler. So I know you're concerned with the cost of a resolution, but what's the cost of someone suing this district when they start getting asked about their immigration status? No one asked you if you agree with it. I know you said, I don't agree with that. We should be able to ask. No one cares if you agree with it. It's the law, and if you want to go to Washington, D.C., go for it. Jim Kohler and then Liz Barker. Hi, I'm Jim Kohler. I'm a parent of a Venice High School lacrosse student. First of all, I'd like to thank 
each of you for the feedback that I've been given for the former Venice High School head lacrosse coach Carver. Oh, that's right. You didn't respond. Now, did you? I've heard you're in the middle of a lawsuit. Is that true? Well, if it is, I would have appreciated at least a comment stating that due to legal reasons, we cannot respond. But I didn't get that. So, I've also heard that there were some allegations against the head football coach, Coach Peacock. Back on August 26, 2023, he was accused of drug testing a student without, with the parent's permission. And it was with the parent's guidelines and inappropriate communication with the parent. The parent had requested an investigation and it was performed by Sarasota HR investigator Brooke Cambria. It was completed on October, 20, October 6, 2023. As a result of this investigation, it was determined that Mr. Peacock did receive parental permission, but it was not stated whether, this, whether his guidelines were followed or not. It is my understanding threatening statements were made to the student about being able to play if he came to the school, to the school board. Is this the way it should be? The guidelines and permission was supposed to supposedly contingent on it being a swab test, not a urine test, and it was to be videotaped. This didn't happen. It's also alleged that he made inappropriate comments to the student while operating as a school employee. This was witnessed and professed by another employee. Another allegation is that he had inappropriate communication with the parent of which Mr. Peacock admitted to. Is this the way the coach should act? This was all documented in over nine pages of documentation and presented to Mr. Al Hareda, the head of SRQ HR. To my knowledge, there was no disciplinary action stated that ever occurred. With about, what about the, the same coach who wiped off Coach Jamie Carver's desk onto the floor. Is this assault or battery? Could Jamie Carver have pressed charges? It is my understanding that he could have and should have. So, should, uh, and what did Jamie Carver do? He got terminated. Why? Hmm, that's a big question. He built up the boys lacrosse team, which is going to district semifinals. Thank you, sir. Liz Barker, then Elizabeth Bornstein. Superintendent Connor, board members, good afternoon. I'm Liz Barker, mom of four children in Sarasota County Public Schools, former school psychologist, president of the PTO at Lakeview Elementary School, and candidate for school board. I was really intrigued to see the contract for PACBAC on the agenda today as a proposed tool to help high school students improve their written expression skills. This tool is being introduced due to the new fast writing exam that will be administered in ninth and 10th grade. The way that we teach writing in our schools is something I've had concerns about and advocated for for some time. Knowing how to write is an incredibly important life skill and it's one we do a huge disservice to our students if we don't emphasize. Written expression and reading comprehension are reciprocal skills. That means that teaching writing has a direct positive impact on reading. Waiting to teach writing until fourth grade when it is first assessed statewide or worse yet high school will do nothing to improve our third grade reading scores. Written expression is a skill that requires regularly scheduled direct, explicit, and systematic instruction. Children cannot learn this skill simply through embedding it in a language arts curriculum. Teaching writing skills should begin in kindergarten with pre-writing skills and continue on through writing college acceptance essays. I was shocked to discover that our district does not do that. The amount of writing your child will be required to do, and I'm not just talking about writing down your answers, I'm talking about sharing and organizing your own unique thoughts on paper, will depend on which school they attend and which teacher they are assigned. My kids have had some great teachers that have emphasized writing, but there have also been years when little has been required of them. 
Last year, myself and some friends who are also former and current educators realized that our children weren't being required to practice their writing skills on a regular basis. We were surprised that every elementary student wasn't asked to keep a daily journal, which is common practice across most districts, and that writing wasn't recognized as a block in the school schedule. We brought our concerns to the district and were informed that here we integrate writing into the ELA block, but it is not explicitly and systematically taught in isolation as its own subject. I believe we should change that, and today's consent agenda item makes it clear why. When used in conjunction with strong instruction, PACBAC could be an innovative tool to help students tweak their writing. It is not, however, a substitute for evidence-based, consistent, direct instruction. We have to provide our teachers across the district and in every classroom the structure and tools to systematically teach our students writing year to year in a way that builds on itself via a shared writing framework. This is work that cannot be done by an AI program. I'm asking this board to investigate developing an actual writing curriculum so that every student, regardless of their school or teacher, will have access to high quality writing instruction that prepares them for life after graduation. Thank you. Elizabeth Bornstein, and then just have one named Babbitts. Greetings, Superintendent, Board Members, Board Attorney. I'm Elizabeth Bornstein. I'm a parent of a student in the district. I'm a Level 2 volunteer for seven years, and I'm a taxpayer. I'm an advocate for my child. I'm an advocate for her school and I'm an advocate for Sarasota County Schools. I resent being called anything else. And I resent being diminished and chastised for my presence here as an advocate. Plato once said, the measure of a man is what he does with power. Essentially, the value of a person is what they do when they're in charge and how they act when they're in charge. Look, I wish that you could have the work session on a totally different day than the board meeting because I'm a working parent and an advocate and I'm trying to pay attention to what y'all are doing. You need accountability, so you need me paying attention along with the other folks out here. And we need to come to the board meetings to speak our three minutes so you can hear somewhere and we can be acknowledged by at least some of you looking at us. I'm appalled at what I saw in the work session today. And it was minimal and it was in between me doing work responsibilities. I'm a parent, I have rights. I'm a parent and I'm responsible. And your behavior, if you were my children, you would all be admonished because it is embarrassment to what academic achievement is about. It is an embarrassment to our newer superintendent who has accomplished more all on his own despite the shenanigans of the majority of you. And thank you, Mr. Edwards and Mr. Enos for trying to have some integrity in upholding every student every day. Okay, so the political theater stuff, enough, enough. I saw you pose with the governor, Mrs. Marinelli, okay? This is all politics. There's an election to put you all in your seats. Rise up, do your jobs, represent our children, our children, and give them the education they deserve. And you know what, Mrs. Ziegler? Game on. Mr. Babbitts, and then uh, Xander Moritz. Welcome, Mr. Babbitts. Hello. Uh, my name is Thomas Babbitts. I'm uh, a resident of Sarasota County. Uh, one of my friends informed me about uh, some situation in our schools and sent email to the board. Uh, I just want to read her email. So here we go. Uh, I'm aware that uh, there is a discussion and some controversy over the Sarasota County government and funding for United Way. I read Commissioner Moran's piece in the Sarasota Tribune newspaper and I completely agree with his stance. 
Taxpayers should not be paying for the service that is referring minors to Planned Parenthood without parent consent. I also want to point out that a couple of uh, weeks ago, my daughter's elementary school, Tyler Ranch, he in Venice was having the students to do a fundraiser for United Way. Uh, and the flyer is attached. There was a, this, uh, that was distributed school-wide and to parents' emails. The school staff was wearing flamingo-shaped glasses, and there were a hundred mini flamingos stuck in the grass out front of the school for all parents to see while the parent drop off and pick up line. The school district bribed the children with a pizza party for the class who raised the most money. Who paid for those glasses, yard flamingos, and pizzas? United Way or the school taxpayer money? Why are school staff being used as fundraising pawns for outside organizations and don't benefit the school? Commissioner Moran pointed out that uh, according to the, the tax feelings, United Way has over $45 million. Yet Sarasota County taxpayers are funding them to the tune of over 100000 per year, plus exploiting school children to fundraise. This is unacceptable. If, indi if individuals want to donate their hard-earned money to an organization that promotes abortion to minors without parent consent, they are free to do so. But the Sarasota County government and schools should not be involved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Xander Moritz and then Alice Blueglass. Welcome, Mr. Moritz. Earlier today, Tom Edwards presented a resolution which states that this board is committed to serving all of its students equitably, as is the law. This resolution is so inoffensive, so simple, so obviously agreeable, so objectively acceptable, that it almost begs the question, why propose it at all? The answer is that Tom Edwards is listening. He is listening to the parents, teachers, students, and concerned community members who have shown up to this boardroom every meeting for the last five months. He is listening to the students and teachers who spend their days in our classrooms and have shared that they feel unsupported. He has listened as students, teachers, and parents alike have all come to this boardroom and said that they need better to be able to succeed. And because it is Tom's job to ensure student achievement and teacher performance, he is listening to students and teachers as they tell him what they need to achieve and perform. This board unanimously agreed on the content of Tom's resolution, but refused to move forward on it because they were worried about sparking political controversy. But how would showing that you are willing to collaborate with someone you disagree with to accomplish something that you all agree on spark political controversy? How would affirming your commitment to doing something that you claim you're already doing create political controversy? How would showing that you're listening to your constituents and taking action within the confines of our law create political controversy? You all agree you want what's best for students. You all agree you must follow the law. And so even if you think this isn't necessary, it at least isn't harmful, and it at least meets the needs of some of your constituents who are a part of that every student every day. How would figuratively shooting down and literally ripping up a universally appreciated resolution just because you don't like the man who proposed it caused political contra... You know, actually, I would worry about that last one. I would just focus on the last one. Thank you. Alice Blueglass and then Lisa Schur. Good afternoon. My name is Alice Blueglass. I am a retired teacher and a school volunteer at this point. Uh, I want to just mention my family business. My family business is education. I was a teacher and a principal. My husband was a teacher and a superintendent. My children are principals and teachers. So indeed, we have a family business. Um, we heard one day when my husband was superintendenting, he was called out of his office and in the lobby was a young man with 
one leg and crutches, and it was Oscar. Oscar had been a, a fourth grade teacher in my husband's school classroom when he was a teacher. And he came back to see a teacher who made a positive difference in his life. And that's what I want to say throughout my whole little speech right now. I beg you, I beg all of us to make a positive difference. Now, you, I know, do not interact with the children, do not interact with the teacher on a daily basis. Teachers do that, staff members do that. But your decisions and your thinking can certainly make a difference a positive difference. Your actions will make a positive difference. You are the decision-making people in this district. You are a vital part of the education life in Sarasota. We heard a wonderful, prideful presentation by the Woodlands principal. And he, you cannot disagree with this, is making a positive difference on all of the children that he interact with. So if at the end of the day, gentlemen and ladies, you question your decisions and you question the reasons for your decisions and you are unsure if they're making a positive difference, rethink your actions going forward and think about Oscar who came back after being in Vietnam to find the person who made a positive difference in his life. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Lisa Schur and then Julie Forstier. My name is Lisa Schur. I'm a citizen and taxpayer of Sarasota County. Uh, I'd like to first commend Craig Maniglia for the new district website. It's such an improvement on the previous website. It's so much more user-friendly and easier to navigate. Job well done. Uh, I attended the school board work session, and I'd also like to commend Tracy Cardenas and Rachel O'Day for their presentation on our district's VPK program and all of the work that clearly went into the program. We are so pleased that this administration is taking pre-K education so seriously. Every student, every day. I'm an advocate for public education. You can call me an activist, you can call me mafioso. I don't really care. I believe in public education. It gave me everything that I am. I'm really concerned that Karen Rose is not fully committed to all of the students in this district. How else can we explain her speech to the Proud Boys at the Hollow on December 3rd, 2021, where she stated, as far as I'm concerned, totally and completely highlight and delete the Federal Department of Education. She said, it has no place. We have the video if you'd like to see it. Would Mrs. Rose care to explain how are we going to safeguard the rights of our ESE students without the federal DOE? Is the Florida Department of Education going to pick up the slack with funding and other civil rights safeguards? Remember, Florida is number 48 in the U.S. in per pupil funding and 46 or 47 depending on the survey and teacher salaries. And that's before we've been gutted by vouchers. Clearly, with the underfunding of our public schools and the use of vouchers to strip more funds from the schools, the education and well-being of public education students is not at the top of anyone's list in the governor's office or the legislature. I'm concerned about who's going to be left in the public schools after all the defunding is complete. You see, this is personal to me. Um, it's going to be the ESC students and the ESL students, the ones who take more money and effort to teach. And you want to do away with the greatest source of protections for these students, Mrs. Rose? I actually have a sister who was a special ed student in the 1970s. Her classes were taught in a janitor's closet. Five or six kids, completely different levels, shoved into a closet because there were no protections then. That's where we're headed now. If protections, if the only protections these kids have are in the state of Florida, and you're in favor of that. As for Mrs. Ziegler and her, as always, pathetic attempt to backpedal today on the matter of immigration comments. Sorry, sis, too little, too late. You said you wanted documentation. That's illegal. But you know what? We got gotcha. you. Julie Forrestier, 
and then uh, Lance Schilling. Good afternoon, board. My name is Julie Forrester, and I assure you I am as tired of coming to these meetings as you are of having to listen to me. But every single week, we uncover more and more about the ways this board is catering to special interests over the needs of students, parents, and teachers in the district. The things that have come to light most recently include yet another way you, Mrs. Ziegler, are using our children as political pawns. It turns out that your poking around on the immigration issue was a play taken directly out of the Heritage Foundation's playbook. For those of you who don't know who the Heritage Foundation is, they are a major donor of Moms for Liberty and the Leadership Institute, which Mrs. Ziegler has been closely affiliated and founded the founded, founder of Moms for Liberty and was on uh, the payroll for the Leadership Institute. Given what we know about Bridget's modus operandi, it's not surprising that she is beholden to yet another outside organization. The irony has not escaped me that Bridget was the one talking about not letting outside organizations influence this board, when that is exactly what she does. Now for you, Mrs. Rose. My understanding is that Eric Robinson is a paid campaign staff person for you. I want to know if I have that fact correct. The reason I'm concerned about this is because in addition to Eric being simultaneously put on the finance and audit committees, it is also my understanding that the Argus Foundation, which is currently run by Eric Robinson's wife, was, is being consulted for the referendum. I want to know, what is the relationship? Will they also get paid and why were they chosen to do this work on the referendum? I, as a taxpayer and a parent and guardian of students in the district, am outraged by the lack of oversight and the gross fiscal irresponsibility we're seeing. We need this board to do better. We are tired of the corruption and of having our children used as stepping stones. I am here to remind you that you have a responsibility to the students, teachers, and parents in the district. Please start representing us so that we don't have to keep showing up here week after week. I said it in the last meeting and I'll say it again. You are the source of the discomfort you are experiencing. If you were to focus on student achievement and creating a safe, high achieving academic environment for all students, the public comment would certainly align. You can do better, so please start doing better. Please start listening to us responding to us and incorporating our feedback into your actions. We want to feel like our voices are being heard, not just disregarded. Thank you. Lance Schilling and then Theoni Sublis. Uh, hello, my name is Lance Schilling. I'm from Nokomis, Florida. Both my daughters went to Venice High School and actually brought the Venice High School soccer team the very first uh, championship in, uh, in history, so I'm pretty proud of them and the school. Um, I have a quick question. It's a very simple one. Uh, we can agree that a lot of people go to Chick-fil-A, correct? Yes, a lot of people go to Chick-fil-A. Most people go back to Chick-fil-A, right? The lines are the longest, but those people are amazing. It doesn't matter how long the line is, they get those people through. So tons of people go to Chick-fil-A, tons of people go back to Chick-fil-A. But if you worked at Chick-fil-A, you wouldn't think anybody would be happy because in the comment box, most of it's just negative. Because positive people don't take the time to go into Chick-fil-A and talk about what a great experience they had. <laughs> so what I'm saying to you guys is this. What you're hearing over here are just the few people who aren't happy with what you're doing. It's not the majority of the people out there in Sarasota County like me who have jobs. I wasn't going to come here today. I'm like, man, I'm busy. Do I really have time to do that? But I'm glad I did because I'm probably the only person in here who's going to tell you guys that you're doing a great job. We appreciate what you guys uh, are doing. We're not going to bully the speaker either. We appreciate right. what you're try. doing. People come in here and they throw a lot of stones at you. A lot of hate things towards you guys. Don't listen to it. Don't let it drag you down. You're doing great things. And the reason why you're in your seats right now is because Sarah Sotans voted you in those seats. So please know that when you go home. I'll say a few things real quick. I was going to talk about Jalen, but he already left. Uh, 
let's see. I'm here to thank all of you for focusing on ed educating our students in reading, writing, math, and factual sciences. People stand in here and ask you to focus on student achievements, all while they ask you to continue divisive teachings like CRT, Critical Race Theory, 1619 Project, White Fragility, White Guilt, LGBTQ Studies. None of this should be taught in our Sarasota County Schools. I know the small group of people behind me who represent the beliefs of very few Sarasotans show up here with the loudest voices. These people want you to believe that the community is not happy with you and that couldn't be farthest from the truth. A few people are making a lot of noise about one of the board, the school board members. These people create a chaotic environment and then they want you to believe that if you just step down, the chaos, the chaos is going to stop all of a sudden. Don't let uh, the few loud people behind me uh, and in the community win. Stay right where you are and keep doing and delivering for our students like you've been doing. These few loud individuals also claim that removing inappropriate sexual and pornographic books from our children's school library we call it banning books. Do not bow down to these sick individuals who seem to have nothing more productive to do in their life than to come in here and throw stones. Sarasota County has a strong educational system for our kids. People are not leaving Sarasota County. They are flocking to our school district in the groves. Thank you for all that you do, and God bless all of you. And the final speaker of the day, Theone Subles. Good afternoon, board. Thank you for having me. I'm Dr. Theoni Sublis. I am a former teacher in the county, a former student in the county. I have a ninth grader in the county, and I am a teacher educator at a local university. Um, I have this whole speech prepared, but a little bit of a response to that. Usually I speak to um, a citizen me, citizen Theoni, but a grassroots effort has been organized in our community, and the name of our organization is Public Education Network Sarasota, of which I am the board chair. So I'm not a single voice speaking to you today. I'm a voice of dozens of citizens and organizations in this community, people who can't attend these meetings, especially when they're at 3 o'clock. I was teaching at the university today. My class in Tampa ended at 2, and somehow I made it here by 3.15. It was important for me to speak in front of you. So it's not just the people in the room. Today I speak as a representative voice of people in the community that can't be here. So what I really want to get to today, usually I'm standing in front of you in defense of teachers. <laughs> uh, my career, my love, uh, the foundation for our entire democracy is a good public education. Today I'm going to talk to you, confront you a little bit with a different lens of defending teachers, and that's with fiscal transparency. I'm so disappointed in this board's decision to approve the new charter school application in this community, the Sarasota Classical Preparatory Academy, a charter that was unanimously denied by the previous board, was approved by this board. An application that was poorly crafted and missing information has deep ties to Hills Hillsdale College. Hillsdale College is the same organization that backed the denied Vermilion curriculum. The curriculum that was denied by the school board has now adopted a school application for charter that has adopted that curriculum. How? How does that make any sense? I'm confused by that. Your very words argue that our hands are tied. The state has changed the law. Even if we deny the application, the state is going to come in and approve the application. That's going to be too expensive for us. I say to you, that's where I want you to spend my money, defending that choice of the state for this community. Maybe not for the entire state, but for this community. I'm not buying that as a reason for approval. I see it as an excuse. Now to the request. The Florida Department of Education has been less than forthcoming with detailed information about the financial impact of vouchers. We want answers to the $1.3 billion price tag on these universal vouchers of school one of which a for-profit charter you just approved last month. We want answers to student retention, teacher recruitment, and teacher retention. Thank, Thank you for your time. That concludes public comment. I'm moving on to additions and corrections to the agenda. Superintendent Connor, please. Yes, Madam Chair, an addendum was added to item seven, the instructional classified personnel report. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, approval of the consent agenda as amended. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as amended. Uh, please vote. I'm not seeing anything pop up. Your voice vote. I refreshed. <laughs> so we'll. Oh, oh, here it is. And the consent agenda, um, as amended, um, passes unanimously. Uh, new business, item number 28, agreement with Phoenix Counseling Service Support, Inc. Uh, Mr. Connor will present this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. The following agreement with Phoenix Counseling will expand our mental health services for our secondary students. It is an interagency agreement, one um, that we would be adding to um, some other interagencies agreements. We have one with Camelot, Centerstone, Lightshare. This agreement, it will really focus in on middle school and high school to provide when there is a need for a mental health referral that uh, with parent consent and the parent working uh, along the way uh, in the event that um, there are some mental behavioral therapies that are needed, um, they can bridge the gap. Phoenix is committed to working with our secondary schools and be a provider in that space where we are lacking that currently. And um, Again, I want to make sure we understand that this is all done transparently with signed parental consent uh, before any uh, mental health therapies are provided. But it, you know, so many times it is hard for parents to access these resources after school hours, and this will provide the opportunity for that to happen uh, on the school campus, but avoiding uh, impact on instruction, so not necessarily um, interfering with core instruction. Thank you. I'll, I'll look for a motion and a second, then I'll take member comments and questions. Move for approval of the agreement between Phoenix Counseling Service Support, Inc. and the Sarasota County School Board. Uh, there is a motion and a second. Uh, Mrs. Ziegler, please. Thank you. And I want to thank Mr. Connor and Mrs. Jacqueline for um, moving this to new business for a couple of reasons. I know, um, one, it's, it's this topic oftentimes um, I say there's a lot of agreement that there's a lot of need to focus on our mental health and our students and there's certainly a crisis um, but also there has been concerns about um, the parental consent etc. I know that um, over some years there's been great strides made and I feel much better at the posture of things um, in the current state uh, at the status of the district. Um, so I'm, I'm, I appreciate being able to highlight that. I do um, and again I, I know that there is a lot of emphasis and rightfully so for the um, for the, the challenges we are seeing with mental health and, and students, I think there is more and more discussion about um, the emphasis having a negative impact sometimes over, over layering that. And I think that there's no question there are, are families and there are students that, that certainly need those supports. Um, I just, uh, I think that's a conversation that will continue to come up. I don't think necessarily in the board chambers, but it is something I'm keeping a close eye on because we certainly don't want uh, any kind of therapies having um, adverse effects uh, unintentionally. But I will be supporting this and I appreciate you um, pulling it to new business so we could highlight it for the public's transparency. Thank you. Seeing no further questions or comments, please vote. And the uh, agreement with Phoenix Counseling Services Support, Inc. passes unanimously. 
Item number 29, agreement with uh, Power School. Mr. Connor will present, please. Yes, ma'am. The purchasing department has reviewed some competitive solicitations to identify the most valuable um, contracts around uh, staffing evaluations and professional development. So we are currently on an outdated system um, that is on its last leg in terms of how we house our, our staff evaluations and performance. Um, so we have sought a solution here that will actually be able to house all of those in the most up-to-date modern technologies uh, with our new evaluation systems for instructional staff and administrators as well as all of our staff eventually. That is also paired with a professional learning repository so that it can connect staff when there's an identified area of need for progress um, in terms of professional development, they can blend together. So we're excited about this. It is a part of a current uh, suite of technologies that we're using with PowerSchool. So this will live under one umbrella, which just makes things more efficient and effective for us. So we bring this for your approval today. Seeing no further uh, comments or questions, ask for a uh, agree uh, motion, please. I move that the agreement with Power School and the Sarasota County School Board be approved as presented. There is a motion and a second for the agreement with uh, Power School. And seeing no comments or questions, please vote. Are you, did you vote? But it's not showing it. Yeah. Okay, it thank yep. you. Uh, and uh, the agreement with Power School item number 29 passes unanimously. Item number 30, job description for ESC compliance coordinator. Mr. Connor, please. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in the next three items, actually, this is all um, was initiated through the ESC review. So as we're continuing to make progress um, through that, uh, you know, there's a timeline that we are working on to diligently to ensure that we um, comply with what we committed to in our recent review that we shared with you at our uh, previous workshop. This is a revised job description from ESC compliance liaisons to ESC uh, compliance coordinators. Just we're really reflecting and aligning uh, the roles and responsibilities of the job. So this position will enhance our compliance with state and federal regulations and it will improve uh, overall outcomes for the students with disabilities. So we're excited to present this item as a part of that review. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion please? I move the updated exceptional student education and compliance coordinator position, formerly known as ESC compliance liaison, be approved as presented. Second. There's a motion and a second. Um, seeing no comments or questions, please vote. And the uh, motion to, for the job description for ESC compliance coordinator passes uh, unanimously. Item number 31, job description for ESC instructional facilitator. Mr. Connor, please. Yes, again, uh, in accordance with the ESC review, this is another revision of our current ESC liaison position to EA, ESC instructional facilitator, which is just marking a shift towards a more active role in supporting our teachers in the classroom. Uh, with pedagogy and helping students uh, in terms of their uh, achievement. So it, it really will be, um, I think, an enhanced role as it currently is. And this new job description will be better aligned to what we intend that position uh, and its outcome to be. Thank you. Motion, please. I move that the updated exceptional student education instructional facilitator position, formerly known as ESE liaison, be approved as presented. Second. There is a motion and a uh, second, seeing no comments or questions. Please vote. And item number 31, job description for ESE instructional facilitator passes unanimously. 
Item number 32, uh, job description for ESE program facilitator. Mr. Connor, yes, I once, will present. Once again, with the ESE review, this is a new job description, a new position that we are proposing called the ESC program facilitator. It is designed to provide specialized support for students with uh, disabilities. It is uh, really going to be vital as they evaluate uh, the implementation of IEPs and compliance and with fidelity, and they'll also be providing coaching guidance and support at the school level to support our, our teachers um, and our students with disabilities. So we'll, we look forward to this new job description really moving the needle for this population. Is there a motion? I move the new job description for exceptional student education program facilitator to be approved as presented. There is a motion and a uh, second for jo job description for uh, ESE program facilitator. Seeing no comments or questions, please vote. And the item passes unanimously. Item number 33, job description for state and federal programs and grants coordinator. Mr. Connor, please. Yes, ma'am. So this is a position that has been um, actually vacant for almost three years now. We have had a very hard time trying to fill this position. So we are asking that the board move this uh, salary scale based on qualification and experiences from a level H to a G. Uh, we think this may be able, uh, this upgrade will be enough to uh, allow this to be a competitive position. So we ask for that approval. Thank you. Is there a motion? I move the revised job description for the state and federal programs and grants coordinator be approved as presented. Second. Is there a second? Second. There is a motion and a second. Seeing uh, no comments or questions, please vote. And the item uh, job description for state and federal programs and grants coordinator passes unanimously. Item number 34, job description for program specialist, professional learning generalist. Thank you. This is a pivotal new position uh, within our professional learning department. As you know, the professional learning department uh, right now is two people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is our executive director, Mr. David Jones, and uh, Carol K. Brown, who is over leadership development. So the goal here is to provide support to that department so that we can actually move towards our strategic goals of improving overall performance and supporting our teachers. I think this will lead to enhanced job satisfaction with our teachers and also making sure that our students are exposed to high quality education. So we do anticipate that it'll have a positive effect on retention. Uh, it will help improve the quality of, of teaching and learning going on in our classrooms. Uh, many benefits of ensuring that we are always enhancing our teachers' practice, um, which is our goal at all times. So we're looking forward to really rounding out this department so that we can push forward with uh, many of our initiatives that we've planned. Is there a motion? I move that the program specialist professional learning generalist job description to be approved as presented. Second. There is a motion and a second. And seeing no questions or comments, uh, please vote for the job description for program specialist professional learning generalist. And the item passes unanimously. Item number 35. Job description for Senior Project Manager Construction. Mr. Connor, please. Yes, ma'am. I'll, um, I'll go over the next two, actually, because they are very closely connected. Right now, we do have a budgeted position for a project manager for construction. Um, the proposal here is to drop that vacancy because we have been unsuccessful in filling this position. We've had some applicants. None of them have been qualified uh, based on the job description. So we want to create a tiered approach here. We want to start with a assistant project manager, uh, find someone that will fit that qualification, give them the experience, and build them up to eventually move into this role, uh, the senior project manager position. So this will happen. It's a budget neutral at this point, but that is the intent is to um, be able to just spread spread out and try to find someone that could fill this role um, through assistant and then tier it up to senior project manager. 
Thank you, sir. Do I have a motion? I move that the job description for senior project manager construction be approved as presented. <clears throat> second. There's a motion and a second for job description for senior manager, senior project manager construction. Seeing no comments or questions, please vote. And the item passes unanimously. Item number 36, job description for assistant project manager construction and Superintendent Connor has addressed that item. Um, do I have a motion? I move that the job description for assistant project manager construction be approved as presented. Second. There's a motion and a second. Uh, seeing no comments or questions, please vote. And the motion uh, passes unanimously. Item number 37, job description for executive director, elementary schools. Uh, Mr. Connor uh, will present, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. This position of executive director of elementary schools it will be a vital as we look to uh, expand our support, uh, as essentially in our elementary schools. As you know, uh, when you take our 23 elementary schools and our three combination schools, we have a total of 26 institutions that are supported by one chief of elementary. And uh, as we've gone through this year, we have, uh, we've had some struggles with that, you know? It's hard when you're stretching Ms. Jim Minnelli out very thin to hit all of those schools very consistently. So the proposal, as you know, we've had this position in the past. This has been something, uh, when I came in, we elevated to the chief of elementary. Uh, I do believe in order to provide adequate support for the multitude of elementary schools that we have, that it's uh, important to bring this role in. Um, we are looking at every way to remain uh, fiscally responsible at the district level. We are not in the business of uh, getting fat at this layer, so we're always looking at ways to cut positions at the district level to make sure that we're directly supporting the schools in the classroom, the students uh, there. So we continue to be committed to that process, and I think when we bring in our, our budget proposal in June, and you see the workshop there, you will see that entire picture. Uh, but uh, I do think that it is a significant uh, support to have this position because we are lacking at our elementary level and just because we're, we're down in terms of, um, we're just outnumbered, I will say. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this will bring some efficiency there. Thank you. I'll ask for a motion and then address member comments and questions. So is this to add more schools to Ms. Minnelli? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I make a motion to, uh, for the new job description for executive director of elementary schools to be approved as presented. Second. There is a motion and a uh, second. Uh, Mr. Edwards, please. Ditto, Mr. Connor. <laughs> um, when we talked about this, I think it was a little over a year ago when we were reorganizing, I was in favor of having two people um, working on elementary schools, especially as we talk about third grade reading scores. And uh, I, I know how hard it is to get from North County to South County several times a day. So um, I, I will be supporting this. Mrs. Ziegler, please. Thank you. Mr. Connor, I appreciate you highlighting it. I think from, I know we talked about this in advance, um, and anyone from you know, the community looking at a lot of the job descriptions that are listed out today um, on its own versus in isolation versus kind of the roundabout way that we'll be um, discussing the overall organizational chart, the financial impact, the budget, uh, as you mentioned in June, can be... Um, can be concerning and make it appear that we're fat, as you said, that <laughs> um, we're top heavy. And, and I don't think any, I, I know I personally don't take that lightly and I, I believe very firmly that um, my fellow colleagues don't as well. I will say that in addition to um, the significance and the priority of early education, as we talked about earlier, but even just elementary and getting every all of our students on track and having that support is pivotal. Um, and so I, I certainly do support this. I also wanna highlight that there have been, um, even today uh, on the agenda, but there are certain mechanisms and systems in place that are being now implemented that have not been there when it goes, as it pertains to administrative accountability measures and lining it up with our goals. And so for the public, I think that's a really important part to know that we are implementing those systems that once upon a time were not there. And I think that allows um, 
for us to evaluate and continue to grow. And um, I'm excited for what's to come. So I will be supporting this, but I did want to highlight that because I know that Austin Times raises um, concern uh, in the public when we go and include or add more administrative positions. So thank you. Well, I have to add to that, Mrs. Ziegler, that it's adding administrative uh, positions and not getting results is one thing. Yep. We're getting results. Systems are being strengthened. Uh, there's accountability and instruction and learning. Teachers are being listened to. And we appreciate all of you. Very, a good deal of, re of respect for each of you. Um, please vote. Seeing no further comments, let me just confirm there are no further comments or questions. And the job description for Executive Director Elementary Schools passes unanimously. Item number 38, Certified Public Accountant for the Audit Selection Committee. Mr. Connor will present, please. Okay, so we're going to handle this as we do uh, typically when we have um, a vote for chair or vice chair. Uh, so I'll just be uh, following the script. So at this time, uh, we, we are now presenting the need to appoint a certified public accountant to the Audit Selection Committee. So please note that I'll be taking nominations. So as opposed to a motion, there is no need for a second. Nominations are now in order. Um, for certified public accountant for the audit selection committee. Are there any nominations? Madam Chair, may I? Yep. Uh, just to give the, to let the public know, uh, ultimately when I became the chair of the audit committee, once I went in there, it was identified that we were not, had enough members based upon uh, statutory guidelines in reference to this. Uh, Mr. Robinson was already on the board as an appointed member, um, and he is a CPA. And it was presented at the audit selection committee meeting in reference to filling of the position to be able to be in compliance. And Mr. Robinson, he said that he would, which ultimately he was on there. So it's the same number of votes. So being the CPA does not mean anything different from being a board member. It fulfills the requirements. So I'm going to give that a uh, little bit of history in, the, in advance. So I'd make the nomination for Eric Robinson to move into the CPA position. So Mr. Enos has moved for a nomination for Eric Robinson as the certified public accountant for the audit selection committee. Are there any other nominations? Uh, Mr. Edwards is, uh, I know you I don't, don't have. have nomination. Okay. Close okay. Um, seeing no further nominations, nominations are now closed. So those in favor of Eric Robinson serving as the certified public accountant for the audit selection committee, please vote now. Did you say aye? I need to speak before oh. I cast my vote. Okay, we'll, yeah, we'll open up for discussion, I guess. Um, sure, we can open it up for discussion, absolutely. Thank you. Let the um, record reflect that I have the floor until I yield back. Um, at the last meeting, um, I... Uh, there was a dust up about uh, the floor t being taken back for me and what I'd like to sort of uh, talk about is that um, both this nomination and the financial committee nomination were side by side and then it was taken off. So I want uh, my conversation to reflect two things. One, I'm not disparaging Mr. Robinson in any way, shape, or form. He was put on the audit committee when Ms. Rosa and uh, I were elected, and he seems to have done a very good job. So um, I, I have no, um, no problem with that. Um, but I did approve him for the financial committee, and where I have a problem is I wouldn't have done that if those votes were side by side, um, which was what it was intentionally, and when it was taken off, my assumption was, oh, well, maybe they're not going to put Mr. Robinson on the audit committee, then I will go ahead and approve him for the financial committee, and now it's back. Um, with Mr. Robinson. So from my particular point of view, um, I am, I know that, again, I was trying to get my words out and it was taken away from me the last time that uh, legally there may be nothing standing in the way of having Mr. Robinson on the Financial Advisory Committee and the Audit Committee, 
But ethically, I personally have a problem for reasons that have been mentioned in public comments because he is um, a financial uh, a component of one of our fellow board members campaign because Mrs. Robinson will be leading the referendum. I think that uh, no offense to the Robinson family and their desire to want to be part of the community, I think that it's just too much and ethically it's a problem. So I will not be supporting Mr. Robinson for this particular vote. I want to be very clear, it has nothing to do with Mr. Robinson and his service to the community. It's just there's too much in my personal opinion. And it would be my recommendation that uh, because all of this finance crisscross and its perception, which I was told today, perception is reality. The community's perception, it's not just mine. It's, it's a good deal of the community. Um, I would recommend that this either be pulled for, for vote and, and we re, the board reconsider. I won't make a motion because you never support my motions, but uh, that or bring up this, uh, the financial committee again and have somebody else. There's plenty of volunteers. There's plenty of CPAs out there. There's plenty of folks to choose from. It doesn't have to be Mr. Robinson all day, all the time. The, the divisiveness is startling. I'm going to do a couple of things. Um, and that is ask Mr. Duggan to uh, uh, address not only the legality, but any ethics within our state. And if throwing stones to colleagues um, on the board is going to be our venue, I I'm take pause and I'm concerned because there are stones that can be thrown in a multitude of ways. Uh, I can also look at uh, people who have made financial contributions to campaigns and been uh, recommended for uh, the Financial Advisory Committee. That's easy. It's quite easy. I, I'm going to ask that we act in a professional manner and stay focused. No one's stopping you from talking. The the framework that you are creating on this board is startling. Let's focus in on academic achievement. Please. Uh, Mr. Duggan, will you please address before um, vote uh, any ethical state issues or um, legalities. And for the record, I actually appointed uh, Mr. Robinson uh, to the Financial Advisory Committee a year ago, or eight months ago, whatever time frame that was. It's just surfaced. Uh, for some reason, things were put on hold. Um, and uh, again, attacking is easy. Let's, let's model getting along and being professional. Uh, Mr. Duggan, will you please address that one more time for the public as well as for the uh, media? Yes, thank you. Um, based on my understanding of the circumstances, I don't believe it is a legal or ethical prohibition for Mr. Robinson to serve on both. Uh, I think the matter is uh, within your discretion as a group to decide, um, and that if you choose to do it, you would be within your authority to do so. Mrs. Ziegler, please. Thank you so much. I just wanted to uh, for basically um, Echo that. I, I wanted to. Mr. Edwards had said something. Uh, said something. I, I don't know if the, I'm quoting properly, but something about crisscrossing and about the two uh, committees. And I, I want to be clear that that is not. There is no crisscrossing. Uh, and I think it is really important um, that we be responsible with our the, the facts of what is and isn't taking place. That by no means takes away any board member's um, right to support or oppose uh, a nomination. But I just want to make sure we're clear that there there are no crisscrossing of the various committees. I will also note, just from a historical standpoint, so we have a lot, these, there's not a lot of committees. We have this one and actually the only two, the Financial Advisory Committee and the Audit Committee um, are the only two board sanctioned uh, committees that we have, I, I believe. Um, and that means, uh, ultimately board, board sanction means it's selected by this body versus administrative decision. Um, and over some time, there was no policy about selecting Financial Advisory Committee. We finally got that in the right posture 
and I think that's what caused a bit of delay. Thank you, Mrs. Penner, for assisting us in that, um, which allowed that it's not about any particular board members, but it has a framework that allows for proper succession planning and balances it out where it is um, your nominations based on the respective seat. Uh, the audit committee, and just for just to re re repeat this from a former prior meeting, is dictated at the stat Florida statutory level um, based on the amount of revenue that our district receives. And so there are, there are parameters on what makes up and what constitutes that uh, committee. And that's, that's that. We are in a community where we're fortunate to have a number of very generous people with their time who are incredibly knowledgeable. Mr. Edward, uh, Mr. Edwards, Ms. you as well. Mr. Robinson is definitely one of those people. Um, I know that we've had people on our financial advisory committee um, over the past, de you know, for as long as this existence and have served for, for many, many years. Uh, I know prior to this, there were former, um, campaign consultants that served in uh, on the financial advisory committee uh, and there were certainly ties to uh, campaign consultants uh, with uh, the the referendum political committee etc with former board members I could go on and on my point is, is we're a community we're gonna have those over ties but there is no ethical um, and or conflict of interest. And I think it's really important and it's our responsibility, while you may not support the individual and each board member is absolutely entitled to that, it is important, I think it's, it's our responsibility to ensure that we're not um, putting misinformation out there uh, where that, that, that any improprieties are occurring. So I just want to be clear on that. Thank you. I do have a question. So we're just doing the, the CPA and then there's another nominee for the, the, the District 2 designee? Or are we doing both at the same time? It's my understanding that uh, the, the selection of the member is Mrs. Rose, I believe. Okay, oh yeah, yeah. all right, just want to make so sure. You'll was, just uh, be approving that. Okay. That's not this item. Not this item. Okay, not sorry, this item. thank not you very this, much. The CPA is <laughs> up for nomination. <laughs> sorry, thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Edwards, please. Um, I am not accustomed to having words put in my mouth, so um, that was not an attack. Um, and I understand that, once again, perception is a reality. So I want to be very clear that I did say nothing disparaging uh, to Mr. Robinson. In fact, uh, as Mrs. Ziegler pointed out, I commended the Robinsons for their community service and their community work. So I take offense that uh, I'm being accused of attacking because that is clearly not my intention and I want everyone to be very clear, including the Robinsons, um, not, my, not my intention. Um, I understand that there's nothing in the statutes that describe, um, but it's still, and I wasn't suggesting that anything untoward was happening. I want to again say that to make, but there are a, a lot of people that could be nominated for many of those positions that are available and I will not be supporting Mr. Robinson. Did you have a nomination? I was asked that, um, but I wouldn't embarrass that person because I never, uh, and even though a second uh, wouldn't happen, I've, I've, I've done that a few times where the person I might have nominated wouldn't have gotten a second, wouldn't have gotten support, and I just didn't want to embarrass that, that nomination. I just didn't want to put that person in that position. Thank you. Back to you, Superintendent Connor. Yeah, Madam Chair, too, just to address one of the reasons that was removed uh, from the last agenda was that there was a procedural error and uh, in reference to is that uh, we had to do some things and it was addressed with the attorney and to get some, I had contacted Mr. Dugan in reference to the actual position uh, and what we needed to do. I spoke to Mr. McConnor about that and that we needed to receive the resignation by Mr. Robinson as it, I thought that, again, we could move him since he was already on the committee into another seat. But since they are uh, nominations from each district or, or school board member, that's the reason it was pulled so that we would be able to make sure that it was within compliance and be consistent with the law uh, with Mr. Dugan and, and that hadn't been done at the day of the agenda so uh, we made sure that was corrected and that's why it's on there today uh, because initially the the audit committee is the selection committee of the auditor and does no auditing 
so that's uh, part of what we do, which is per the statute. And uh, CFO is on there with me and me being the chair. Our responsibility is to make sure that as the audit is completed and is presented, then eventually it comes to the entire board. So they do not do any auditing. They're there as, a, as an oversight on the selection of the auditor. So thank you for that. All right. <laughs> Those in favor of Eric Robinson serving as the certified public accountant for the audit selection com committee will do a voice vote. Mr. Edwards? No. Ms. Ziegler? Yes. Ms. Rose? Yes. Mr. Enos? Yes. Ms. Marinelli? Yes. Okay, the recommendation passes four to one. Mr. Robinson will serve as the CPA for the audit selection committee. Chair, I give it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Yeah, we do. Oh, yes, yeah, so we do have to uh, vote. I believe they can do that. Can they do that on the computer, on the item for um, District 2 member selection, Mr. Ch uh, Thomas Chaffee? Yeah, okay. You want to do a voice vote? Okay. Uh, Mr. Edwards? Yes. Oh, let's, yeah, let's get the proper. I'm sorry, I think you need to have a motion to yeah. uh, appoint Mr. Chaffee in a second prior to the vote. To Got it. Approve the, the, the appointment. All right, do I have a motion to appoint Thomas Chaffee for District 2 member for the Audit Selection Committee? I move that we approve the uh, Mr. Chaffee as the appointed uh, designee for District 2 to the Audit Selection Committee. Second. Any discussion? I see no names, no comments, no questions. More formality. You may vote. We do. A, are we going to do a voice vote on that? Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Edwards. Yes. Ms. Ziegler. Yes. Ms. Rose. Yes. Mr. Enos. Yes. Ms. Marinelli. Yes. And 5-0, Mr. Chaffee will be added as a member for the audit selection committee. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Connor. Uh, we have board member uh, comments uh, remaining, and uh, Mr. Edwards, would you like to uh, share comments? I'm good today. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mrs. Ziegler. Um, I want to be brief. Thank you for the students who are patiently waiting here. I will try to wrap this up. I, just because there were so many comments about whether or not we are hearing or listening to public comment, I want to address that. Um, to all of, to the parents who've come tonight, whether uh, I agree with statements, whether or not, I, I do listen. I do understand you care deeply about what's happening because it does impact your child. I 100, I never take that away from anyone and I do believe that. Um, I, it's interesting over some time it does feel like certain things have almost like reversed from three years ago. Um, but at the end of the day, I think even it was reflected in our conversation today when we were talking about public comment, we want to lift up and prioritize our, 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 our taxpayers, our parents um, of current students, um, our students and our staff, and we do listen. That doesn't necessarily mean, well, one, Public comment is not a Q&A, and I know that that gentleman had brought that forward, and I don't know if that was intended to make a demonstration or not, but that does not take away that the fact that we're listening. Um, maybe sometimes, and I believe over the course of five months, as someone used that, that time frame, a lot of comments um, have been addressed during public comment. It may not be the response you want, um, and I'm only speaking as myself. Um, I know I've certainly addressed uh, a number of things, and as I am right now, uh, that are referenced in, in public comment. Um, when it comes to, you know, it, there was certainly a response in the past election um, that does, did put this district on a different course. I think there's a lot of legislation that passed that did put this district and other districts on a different course. Um, I personally am very much supportive of that. Um, and I will stand to, to continue to focus on that and serve every child and every family. Um, but I believe that, that that course correction really did allow us to laser in and narrow and focus on areas that have not been focused on and that really comes down to academic achievement. Absolutely, there are all sorts of other things coming uh, forward and I think the political theater piece <laughs> 
comes up over and over again, and it's all various sides saying it. Listen, these are elected offices. Politics is going to come to play. I think at the end of the day, we don't want politics inside of our academic instructional material or to derail our, our – or to – distract our teachers from their job. There are a lot of statements that were, were referenced today that I, I could go into, but I, I, I want to say that I, I, I am listening. Um, I believe everyone up here is listening. I think that uh, we are in a different direction that we once upon a time were, and I, I, and I stood on that, and I'm, I'm grateful for the direction that we're in. Um, I don't want any student to feel that they are being harmed. I think I take that very seriously when we have students coming and saying that. I know that we've addressed that with the superintendent and other members of staff. Um, if there are legitimate bullying situations, we want them, we want to be assured that they're being taken um, taken seriously, and I have been assured so far, um, but I want to empower any staff or students to, to make sure that they bring their bring those forward. And I'm not, I, I, I feel very confident that every single person up here believes that. Um, when it comes to, you know, obeying the law, there's, it's interesting, a couple different things were said. So stand up for something you believe in, even if you don't, if it doesn't, you know, be a voice for us, I'm just using, kind of summarizing, even if it's, you know, Tallahassee puts forward something that you don't agree with, then on the other time, it's like, oh, well, this is the law. I mean, so <laughs> we are elected officials, and we certainly do stand on things that we believe in, and we put that out there, and that is up to the voters to decide whether or not you want to reelect or elect someone. That's, that's just how it goes. It's the name of the game. Um, but I, I want to make sure people understand that they're being listened to. I, um, I, I know that there is a lot of intentional flame-throwing, uh, and that happens, and it happens on all sides. No one's, no one's innocent of it. Um, I think what I believe the chair has certainly done a good job. Um, I think the, the superintendent and staff, and I, I believe that this board, um, certainly at least my, my hope, is that we preserve this area, this arena, in here, uh, to the focus of our students' academic achievement and our, supporting our staff. People outside of this up here want to say whatever they want to say, fine. I, but I, I, and I don't hold that against anyone. I think at the end of the day, we come in here, pull up our bootstraps, and get to work. And, and that's what I'm committed to doing. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Marinelli, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to reaffirm that I'm not asleep and that I am listening. And those that are still here that used to work with me, that would not be something that I slept or sleep. That would be um, something that would be said about me. But I would like to end on some positive recognitions. I'd like to thank Woodland Middle for, for their excellent presentation, Mr. Grossenbacher, for you know, the culture and, and the relationship, and I think it speaks volumes that he brought a student, and that student talked about all the good things at Woodland. I'd also like to um, recognize Booker High School that all of us board members attended their uh, ribbon cutting of the new visual, visual performing arts, and if anybody in the public has a chance to stop by and see that beautiful facility. It's, it's just astounding. <laughs> and one of the things that was said is that most small towns or towns don't have anything like that, and here we have that at our public schools. And I'd also like to bring to attention that last week Booker Middle and Ashton Elementary had um, events and I wasn't able to go because it conflicted with another event, but I just think it's wonderful that our schools um, involve parents, and I just think the public needs to know all the wonderful things. But most importantly, I'd really like to thank Superintendent Connor and his staff for reviewing not only job descriptions and aligning them to what is going on today, but I think that really benefits our students and our teachers because that provides direct support to the classrooms and also the professional development. And I think it's really the public needs to know that Superintendent Connor and his staff, educators, they're reviewing all the academic programs, what works, what doesn't work and making it um, come in line with all the 
academic push that we're trying to do. And also for the student services staff because, you know, we're talking about bringing outside agencies in and even our own counselors. You have to evaluate. Are they working? Are they not working? If these outside agencies do not work with parental permission, then you don't, you don't have an interagency agreement with them anymore. So, and I, and I think that's something that, um, I know Ms. Mandy's in here and that's what you do, so I appreciate that. And, because I think it's extremely important because, you know, if, if you get the same behavior all the time and nothing changes, it tells you it's not working. So I just want to really thank everybody, all the staff, for really making these changes because we are on a trajectory, both academically and our behavior supports, emotional supports for our students. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're very welcome, uh, Mr. Enos. Yeah, uh, reiterate uh, the staff, great presentation today, uh, Rachel O'Day and her staff and everything they put together. I mean, uh, to really trying to move that needle at third grade reading, you know, as I was told, you know, you learn to read up to the third grade to then you read to learn the rest of the way, so how important it is. Also, the VPA uh, at Booker High School, Dr. Shelley, what a legacy, unbelievable. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, as they said, it's, I think like uh, Ms. Marinelli said, I don't even think it could be in the southeast that the core construction has never built anything like that. It's so unique with catwalks. I mean, it is, it is a, an amazing facility. The other thing I talk about is that this is National Telecommunicators Week. Uh, which that is, is all your dispatchers that take the 911 calls. It's a very, very stressful job. They have a lot of turnover. Um, but this, you know, you need to have good people on the other end when it's the time of an emergency. Um, wanted to make sure everybody knew that it was National Telecommunicators Week. Um, they work, you know, you could think they get the call at the front end, and they never sometimes have the results. And they, they live with all of that stress. Um, and my hat's off to them as, uh, as commander of the Emergency Operations Bureau at the Sheriff's Office. Um, I had 104 dedicated people that just took 911 calls. So this is this week. And then also, uh, Yana is going to have a presentation on April 25th at 5.30 at Sarasota Middle School. Um, there is a really exciting speaker who will talk on social media and its impact for parents um, at 5.30. That'd be me. And, uh, well, maybe I'm, uh, we'll see how good I am. But anyway, uh, if anybody wants to come out, Yana, at 5.30 at Sarasota Middle School, I know it's during the dinner hour. I think this is their third presentation so far, one north, central, and one north, one south, and now this is the central presentation. So, again, I appreciate uh, Ms. Coker and Ms. Jackalone and everybody's hard work over there in order to uh, get this to, to, to the parents and to the students that are available. So thank you for all your help. Mr. Edwards, are you sure you don't have anything you'd like to add? No, thank you so much for asking, but I'm, 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 I bet they're anxious to, <laughs> so we're, I'm moving it along for all of us. <laughs> the, um, not before I recognize the Education Foundation, um, who will be uh, celebrating uh, five high school students and uh, five uh, seniors at each school, five juniors uh, for the Strive Awards, awards that uh, recognizing students who have uh, overcome significant obstacles. Uh, they'll be doing that on April 18th. I wanted to recognize them and thank them for supporting our students. I also uh, want to re-emphasize the growth in grade three reading for the first time in several years on the midterm uh, progress monitoring reports and recognize our executive uh, staff. I have the utmost confidence in you uh, and I know that you're supporting our, our teachers. Uh, we've moved uh, to the uh, science of reading. There is absolutely astonishingly great things happening uh, in this district and I know uh, Mr. Connor, Superintendent Connor, with your leadership that we are on uh, an incredible trajectory trajectory for the success of every student uh, every day. Looking forward uh, to the strategic plan. I know it's right around the corner. Proud of the ESE review that took place and all of those components that will be in the strategic plan. Um, it, we have a lot to celebrate and I, I want to make sure that I as a board member recognizing that hard work of our staff. I was also asked uh, by our uh, religious uh, community at large. 
um, to um, announce for those who uh, recognize the National Day of Prayer is May 2nd. It's an annual day of observance um, that was designated by the United States Congress. So that is May 2nd out of respect for our religious community making that announcement. And um, thank you all for uh, being here. Our next regular board meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, May 7th at 6 o'clock p.m. And this meeting is adjourned and um, we'll be meeting with the, the board will be meeting with the star leadership students. Thank you all.